And if you have a Bible, turn to Psalm 118. Psalm 118 will be there this morning. Uh, I want to say thanks to Scott Tillman for last week. Appreciate that very much. I also wanted to mention to you all that uh, this is my first Sunday since uh, Lipscomb announced a new president. And uh, I wanted you to know I'm very excited about that. Um, I know Candace to be a woman of character, of integrity, and of deep faith. And I think she'll do a marvelous job. And I think she's also related to somebody here among us. I've heard the rumor she and Sandra Ellis are somehow related. I'm not, is that right? You've heard that? Yeah, okay. So she comes from good stock. She's related to Sandra, Sandra Ellis. Uh, I'm even more excited about freshmen coming back, which is tomorrow. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the freshmen will move in tomorrow and on Tuesday. And Quest Week will start on Wednesday. And hopefully we'll have a bunch of freshmen here uh, next Sunday and uh, begin to have the opportunity to pour our lives into their lives. And so I'm very excited about that. And then the third thing that I'm excited about, I don't get as excited as uh, Tillman does, but I'm going to try to. You ready? So, Y'all ready? Man, I'm pumped about this. So, Actually, I'm really excited. We're going to start a read that we're going to do together as a church for 31 weeks beginning September the 12th. It's called The Story, and it's a journey through the text of the Bible that will take us from Genesis to Revelation over the course of this academic year. We'll start September 12th. We'll end May the 29th. We'll take a little break in late December, early January. But we've ordered copies of this for every family. There's a teen reader, and we've ordered those for our kids. And there's actually a toddler reader that parents do uh, with their children, and we've ordered those as well. We'll start handing those out next Sunday. And so there'll be a way for you to pick one up. What I hope is that you're going to say, how can I get a few extra copies of this to give to some of my friends that I'd like to invite to our church to be a part of that? And the answer is, if you will invite people to come and join us in this journey, we will find a way to get a book to you for them as well. What we know is that having a common read, a common conversation, a common thing that brings us together as a church is going to be really helpful to us uh, in this next season that we're in. And so we'll all be working through this together. Some of our Sunday school classes, our youth, our teens, everyone will be finding a way that they can incorporate this into weekly conversation. But I hope that you're going to be excited to know that just over the course of the year, we're going to read through all of this together. So, I'm pumped. How would I do, Scott? C plus. Uh, <laughs> I think you're probably right. I just, I can't get as fired up as Scott Tillman, but uh, I, I, deep down inside, just please know I'm very excited about that. Let's pray and let's jump into Psalm 118 this morning. Lord, thank you so much for what you're doing in our midst we do want to thank you for President Lowry and for his long and faithful tenure at Lipscomb. We pray a blessing upon him as it rolls towards completion. And Lord, we pray a blessing upon Candace and her family as they step forward to lead Lipscomb into the next phase of what you have prepared for her. Lord, even more, we pray a blessing upon every student, every parent, every sibling, as students begin this journey to come and to be here tomorrow, we ask that you would be with them, that you would walk with them, and Lord, that you would bring those that we can shape and bless, and speak the life of Jesus into, that you would bring them to be a part of our church family. Lord, we also want to pray for the days ahead for us as a church. We want to be people who are formed by your word. We want to find our place in your story we want to understand what it means to be kingdom people. And Lord, we pray that you'll use this uh, season in our church life uh, to more deeply form each of us into the image of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you might also give us eyes to see those around us who just need something. And now we have something to offer them that's concrete and tangible and starting. And Lord, give us the boldness and the courage to invite our friends 
to join us in this story, believing that you'll change their life through the journey as well. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, our ever-living Savior, teacher, Lord, and friend. Amen. So today we're in Psalm 118. It is one of the messianic psalms, a psalm that those who read it, those who sang it, believed, spoke about a coming Messiah, one who would come as God's anointed one to deliver God's people. Psalm 118 has two major sections that are quoted in the New Testament. I've tried to bring those to the surface in some of the readings that we've already done. It also has one of the most famous verses in all the Bible. It's one that each one of us knows. We say it from time to time. And today we'll see the context in which it was originally written. What is that verse that I think is so famous? Well, let me try it again. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so we find in this verse one that has been so common to our conversation, but now we understand, or today we will, how it fits into this, the context. This psalm requires that we understand a little bit of history. And so what I wanted to remind you was is that Nebuchadnezzar came and he destroyed Jerusalem and he sacked the temple and he carried all the precious things to Babylon and the people went into captivity. And it's in the book of Ezra that we discover that God allowed them to come back and to rebuild the temple. And so in Ezra chapter 3, we read about a day when they laid the cornerstone for the temple again. And when they laid the cornerstone for the temple again, notice what they said. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love towards Israel endures forever. The Lord is good, His love endures forever. That's what they sang when they laid this cornerstone. And all the people gave a great shout and praise to God because the foundation had been laid. But if you keep reading, what you discover is those priests and Levites who came from the Holy Family who were teenagers when they were taken into captivity, they've returned. And when they see this second temple that's being built, they begin to weep because it's so small and so tiny. So insignificant compared to the glorious one that Solomon had built. So some are crying because it just doesn't measure up and others are just so happy that there's a temple again. Ezra. Now, we also notice that in Matthew 21, Psalm 118 pops up twice. First, with palms all around it, we read, and the multitude that went before and followed cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna means Lord save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And what we know is that when the people saw Jesus, this messianic psalm came to mind. When they saw Jesus, they realized He's the one we've been waiting for. And they began to sing from Psalm 118. And they began to give to Jesus the glory that you would give to the one who is coming as your Messiah. But not only did the people see Jesus as the Messiah, but later in Matthew chapter 21, we discover that Jesus appropriates words from Psalm 118 himself. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom will be taken away but before that, he says, this became the chief cornerstone. The one that was rejected has become the chief cornerstone. What does that mean? And with that in mind, I want to jump into Psalm 118. And I want to walk you through it pretty quickly. If you'll notice, there's 29 verses. And if I spent one minute on every verse, whoever's doing children's worship would hate me for it. So understand we're going to have to move pretty quickly through this psalm. But Psalm 118, 1 through 4, notice what it says. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures for it forever. 
Israel is supposed to say his love endures forever. The house of Aaron is supposed to say his love endures forever. All the people who fear the Lord are supposed to say his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Now, what does it mean to give thanks to the Lord? It's interesting that that word for give thanks, I just love this image, is when you're walking around and you see something good, you're supposed to take an arrow and fire it towards God, saying, thank you, God, for the birds that sang this morning. Thank you, God, for the food that we just ate. Thank you, God, for the health that allows me to be here. Thank you, God, for the job that I have. And throughout your day, you're just supposed to be hurling praise back to God. Thank you, God. Thank you. You just take every great thing that happens and you say, God, I want to say thank you to you for every good gift. Thank you, Lord. Your love endures forever. And the psalmist wants us to begin by giving thanks to God. By noticing all the things we have to be thankful for. And also realizing that God's love, his goodness, his kindness, his faithfulness <coughs> endures forever. That God is always good. He's always taking care of his people. Now, what the psalmist says is that we as a nation should be giving credit to God and stating from one generation to the next, his faithfulness endures forever. We as a church should be saying from one generation to the next, his faithfulness endures forever. We as God's people should be saying to each other and to our children, the Lord has been good to us. And his faithfulness endures forever. Now, if you read verse 5, what you'll notice is just because the Lord is good and his love endures forever does not mean that life won't be difficult. Because look at verse 5. When hard pressed, when life came crashing down on me, I cried to the Lord who brought me to a spacious place. The psalmist isn't trying to give us some simple view of life that says everything's good all the time. He's trying to say, even when life gets hard, I know where to turn. And so there are several realizations that the psalmist comes to that I want to share with you just quickly. The first thing he notices is that every day the Lord is with me. The Lord is with me, so I don't need to be afraid. I don't need to fear. The Lord is with me. He's my helper. He's my triumph over my enemies. The second realization is that the Lord is not just my helper, but he's also my refuge. He's the place that I go when I need to be rescued or when I need deliverance. Notice what it says in verse 8. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust humans. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust princes. When life is difficult and you don't know where the answer is going to come and you don't know how God's going to provide for you, the temptation is to go rushing to people that you think can bail you out. Or as a country, it's to go rushing to the government and hope that they'll give us something that will bail us out. And the psalmist says, no. When life is hard, run to the Lord. Take your refuge in him. He's your helper. He's your refuge. His name has authority. That's why we pray in his name. Because the Lord has power to do things no one else can do. The Lord has power to change things no one else can change. The nations have me surrounded, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord... I cut them down. They swarmed me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. The psalmist says, there's power in the name of the Lord. And number four, that we are to pursue righteousness. 
Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. And look in verse 19. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me and have become my salvation. Realization number five. God's ways are higher. The stone the builders rejected, the psalmist says, has become the chief cornerstone. The Lord has done it. It's marvelous on our eyes. This, this is the day that the Lord has made. We should all rejoice and be glad in it. We think back to Ezra and the day that the cornerstone was laid, and we should all rejoice that this cornerstone has been laid. But now the psalmist says, no, but there's more important stone that's being laid than that piece of stone. There is a Messiah who is coming as God's anointed, and he is the one that has been rejected that will be the chief cornerstone. Everything God will do will be based upon him. And it will be marvelous. It will be beyond anything Solomon ever created. It will be marvelous in our eyes. So this is the day that the Lord has made. This is God's promise. And we should rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, I, I'm not sure this does justice. But in the 16th century, there was a cathedral in Florence that bought a big piece of marble. And they hired a man in 1464 named Agostino to create a David from it. He started on it, just barely began to flesh out the legs, and then he gave up. It was a few years later when another sculptor stepped forward in 1476, and he was hired to take over this project with this giant slab of marble. But almost immediately upon beginning, he quit. He said, that's an inferior piece of marble. It's not worthy of my work. So the piece of marble sat for 25 years in the elements. And then one day in 1501, a young sculptor of 26 years of age stepped forward. And on September 13th of 1501, he began to work on that piece of stone that all the other builders had rejected. And what came out of it was David. Giorgio Vasari would later write, it was as if he was bringing back to life one who was dead. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In Jesus, everyone thought, there's no way he's the Messiah. That's not what a Messiah does. That's not the way a Messiah acts. That's not the way a Messiah leads or serves. They all rejected him. But God made him the chief cornerstone. And so, celebrate what God has done. The rest of the psalm is a celebration that God is sending his Messiah into the world to redeem all of humankind. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. He's made his light shine upon us with bows and hands. Let's go on the feastal procession up to the horns of the altar in the temple. You are my God. They write, I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. And then notice how this psalm ends the same way it began. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And if you understand what he's done in the cornerstone, you understand in a deep, deep way his love endures forever. We've called this series the great psalms of the church. 
they're not necessarily the psalms that we know best, but they're the psalms that the early church saw Jesus in most clearly. In Acts chapter 1, we read that they were gathered together constantly in prayer. And one of the things we know is that when they prayed, they prayed the Psalter. They prayed the 150 Psalms. And so imagine as they're praying and singing this Psalm 118, and they come to these words, the stone the builder has rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The Lord has done it, and it is marvelous in our eyes. It becomes a way of understanding Jesus and who he is and that God has kept the promise that he made. In Acts chapter 4, after healing a lame man, people gather around. Here's this illustration of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ unleashed in the world. This lame man is now jumping up and down, singing praises to God, and everybody rallies, and Peter and John preach. And then they get arrested. And so they say to the rulers, if we are being called into account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people, it's by the name of Jesus. Remember how we talked about the name of the Lord? It's by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. And then notice what Peter and John want them to see. You remember that song that you've been singing your whole life? They're talking to the elders and to the leaders of Israel. You remember that psalm that you've been singing? As a matter of fact, most people think it was the last psalm that was sung on Passover day. It was the last song that Jesus sang before they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Psalm 118. You remember that psalm? Peter and John say, Jesus is the stone the builders rejected that has become the chief cornerstone. And so what does that mean? It means there's salvation in no one else. There's only one chief cornerstone. You can't have two. You can't have three. You can't have none. You can only have one. Salvation is found in him and him alone. There's no other name under heaven by which any person can be saved. So what are the implications? Let me give you a few quickly and we'll call it a day. Peter picks this up in 1 Peter chapter 2 and he says these words, now you, speaking to believers, followers of Jesus, now you are coming to him as to a living stone. Even though this stone was rejected by humans from God's perspective, it is chosen and valuable. You yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. You, 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 you all are being made into a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. When you became a follower of Jesus, you were placed in this spiritual house. You are one of the living stones that gives praise to the cornerstone. Your life is now part of a people who are a kingdom of priests to serve the Lord Jesus and God our Father. Paul says the same thing. In Ephesians chapter 2, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. And also, you are members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the what? As the chief cornerstone. Here's what Paul's trying to say for you. If you understand this story Everything, everything, everything builds to Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. The whole of everything that's ever happened on this earth points to Jesus 
as the chief cornerstone. The prophets and the apostles all remind us that it's about Jesus. And so, with that in mind, let me give you a few things from this psalm that I just challenge you to do this week. You ready? First off, empty your quiver. What do I mean by that? Fire all the arrows you've got this week to fire and praise to God. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Don't waste your week not giving thanks to the Lord, not telling Him that He's good, and not reminding other people that His love endures forever. This psalm starts with this, ends with this, and it challenges us to start our day and to end our day by giving praise to God for all the great things that He has done for us. When you're feeling isolated and alone, remind yourself, the Lord is with me. When you're feeling helpless, remind yourself to take refuge in the one who can really deliver you. When you're feeling powerless, the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord. And when you're feeling purposeless, enter through the gates of righteousness. Jesus would say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all those other things will take care of themselves. So I ask you this question today. Is your life in alignment with the chief cornerstone? Are you part of this spiritual house that God is building? If you're not, you need to give your life to him in baptism. But you also know that you can live your life in such a way as to not really be bringing praise to the cornerstone Jesus Christ. If you need to get your life back in alignment, get, get right with God. And let God have his way with you. Give thanks to the Lord. He is good. His love endures forever. And if we can help you in any way this morning, that's why we're here. And we encourage you to come to the front as we stand and sing this song together.